There are many people worried that America is going broke. Remember, we're not, this is not a stable situation. We continue to issue, what is it, somewhere between one and two trillion a year. And since the 1980s, that issued debt has accumulated to around $34 trillion, around 120% of America's GDP, reaching levels of federal debt not seen since the Second World War. But the deficit myth by Stephanie Kelton lays out an alternative viewpoint based on the ideas of modern monetary theory, or MMT, which argues that these fears over federal debt are a misguided understanding of how fiat currencies actually work. So how does Kelton explain MMT in her book? And what do others think of MMT? And what about the recent rise of inflation? We'll get to each of those in turn. Listen. Kelton structures her book around a series of myths that make up the broader deficit myth. The first and most familiar of these myths is the idea that you should think of the government's budget as being like a household's budget. And Kelton uses a famous quote from Margaret Thatcher to illustrate this popular view. The state has no source of money other than the money people earn themselves. If the state wishes to spend more, it can do so only by borrowing your savings or by taxing you more. So the myth is that governments must first tax or borrow your money into their bank account, and only then can they spend it. Kelton used the mnemonic TABS to capture this common viewpoint. And it's a convenient myth for the politicians who wish to shrink the size of the state through austerity measures. They claim to have to cut the education or welfare budget in order to pay off the country's mythical credit card. But Kelton credits Warren Mosler as the father of MMT for noting in the 1990s that this view of tax before spending just doesn't reflect what actually happens. As we'll see later, the history of the basic ideas behind MMT go back much further, but the observation still stands. For countries that have financial sovereignty over their own fiat currency, like America, the UK and Japan, the household budgeting myth gets the order of things completely backwards. And that's because these countries are the currency issuer rather than just a currency user. You or I, or indeed individual states or cities within America, cannot simply create new dollars. If we want to use dollars or pounds, we have to first get hold of them. But if the American government needs to spend more dollars, it can just create them. And it does this all the time. It doesn't need to first borrow from the markets or collect tax dollars in order to spend. And here's Ben Bernanke, former chair of the Fed, America's central bank, essentially acknowledging this. Is that tax money that the Fed is spending? It's not tax money. The banks have um, accounts with the Fed much the same way that you have an account in a commercial bank. So to lend to a bank, we simply use the computer to mark up the uh, size of the account that they have with the Fed. So it's much more akin, uh, although not exactly the same, but it's much more akin to printing money than it is to borrowing. So rather than tax and borrow, then spend, what actually happens is spend and then maybe tax and borrow. This sounds radical compared to how we typically think of money and government debts. But as Kelton herself notes, does that mean there are no limits? Can we just print our way to prosperity? Absolutely not. MMT is not a free lunch. And it's also worth noting that this doesn't apply to countries that borrow heavily in foreign currencies, nor, interestingly, to the countries of the euro area who stopped issuing their own sovereign currencies but instead became euro currency users. Only the European Central Bank can issue new euros. And that's one of the reasons why the Greek debt crisis after the 2008 financial crash was so significant. But even for America that issues the dollar, what about all of their $34 trillion debt? Won't they have to pay it back to somebody someday? Now, when taking on a debt, it's always worth remembering that there are two aspects of the debt to worry about. How to pay back the total amount borrowed, the principal of the debt, and how to pay the regular interest payments on the debt, what is sometimes called servicing the debt. And at a basic level, government debt works in the same way, which is why the household budgeting analogy is so tempting. But there are some important differences. 
Kelton uses the classic analogy of money being like water moving around the economy to explain how government debt comes about, imagining an extremely simple model of the economy with just two buckets, one for the government sector and one for everything else in the economy, including foreign debt. Now, if the government spends $100, then taxes back $90, that will leave a surplus of $10 in the non-government bucket and an equivalent deficit of minus 10 in the government bucket. Economists typically want the total sum of all buckets to add up to zero. Now, if this is what happens in one given year, then this minus $10 would be the government's deficit for that year. For America, this is the one to two trillion dollars annual deficit that David Sachs was referring to at the start. As years go by, the cumulative sum of the deficits in each year is the total debt owed by the government. Again, for America, their total accumulated debt is the $34 trillion figure. So that is their current principle on which they owe interest. And I said the debt is owed by the government, but owed to who? We'll come back to that in a moment. Now, I want to note an important phrase that Kelton uses in her book, which is the observation that their red ink is our black ink. The government sector being in debt enables the non-government sector to have a surplus, to be in the black. And conversely, if the government sector were to tax back more money from the broader economy so that they were in the black, that would put the non-government sector into the red. Indeed, Kelton refers to an interesting study by Frederick Thayer in which he showed a noteworthy correlation between years when America paid back substantial amounts of its debt and economic depressions that followed just after. As Kelton put it, fiscal surpluses suck money out of the economy. So as history suggests that paying back too much of the principal debt could actually damage the economy, there is never going to be a moment in time when our children or great-great-grandchildren are going to have to pay back all of the debt. Individual treasury bonds, bills and notes will get paid at maturity but new debt will also be issued that largely maintains the overall debt level. But if the overall debt level isn't going to be substantially paid back, won't it just slowly grow and grow? And then how much debt is too much debt? Well, there are two parts to this. The first is the sustainability of paying the regular interest payments. And the second is the risk of causing high inflation. But before we get to those, it'll be useful to look at what Kelton calls green dollars and yellow dollars. Let's slightly expand our simple model of the economy. When we casually use the phrase the government, we often mean the executive branch of the government, which includes the treasury that manages the government's money and issues different forms of government debt. The central bank of a country, the Federal Reserve or Fed in the case of America, is nowadays mostly an independent body that stands separate from the executive, while still being very much part of the government sector of the economy. And it's only the central bank that can actually create or print new money. It can create new green dollars. The Treasury can't. But the Treasury can issue debt. So if the government of the day spends $1,000, then taxes back $900 so that it is in $100 of deficit, there is a long-standing norm that the Treasury will then issue $100 of debt to be purchased by actors within the non-government sector. So this brings the cash balance of the executive, the government, back to zero by taking on $100 debt. Now, these dollar-denominated debt instruments like treasury bonds, are what Kelton calls yellow dollars, which are almost as liquid as green dollars. But a key difference is that yellow dollars are interest-bearing dollars, whereas regular green dollars do not pay any interest. Now, crucially, the central bank is legally prohibited from lending directly to the treasury. It can't just buy these yellow dollars from the treasury with the green dollars that it can print, but it can buy yellow dollars from the market, and it does so often. Traditionally, central banks buy yellow dollars from the open market as one of their ways to manage interest rates. And once they've bought those yellow dollars, the Treasury's debt is now just owed to its own central bank, owed to just another part of the government sector. Indeed, Kelton notes 
that in order to manage the yield curve, long-term interest rates, the Central Bank of Japan has bought so much of Japan's national debt from the market that nearly half of Japan's debt is now owed to the Central Bank of Japan. So essentially, that debt has already been paid off by the Bank of Japan printing money to pay for it. And after the financial crash of 2008, the use of quantitative easing in America and Britain and the Euro area was, in effect, a way for central banks to end up buying large amounts of government-issued debt. So while the independence of central banks creates the legal fiction that the executive can no longer just print as much money as it wants, in reality, the executive can create as much debt as it wants, creating interest-bearing yellow dollars. And then the central bank can print the money to convert some of these yellow dollars into green dollars in the general economy as it buys up this government debt. And given that that is exactly what's been happening over this last decade, that's why advocates of modern monetary theory are so dismissive of this legal fiction and the deficit myths required to sustain it. But surely there are consequences for all this printing of debt and money. So we need to talk about inflation. But before that, I just want to note one detail about debt sustainability. The general consensus among economists is that as long as the interest rate owed on the debt is less than the growth rate of the economy, then the interest payments on the debt will be sustainable over the long term. And that is why the Bank of Japan was buying so much of its nation's long-term debt to keep the long-term interest rates near zero and therefore below Japan's growth rate. This will, in theory, allow Japan to slowly grow its way out of its debt over time. And because central banks can do this and have various ways to influence interest rates, that is why modern monetary theorists think that servicing the national debt can always be kept sustainable. OK, but what about inflation? Kelton has an interesting quote from JFK speaking in the 1960s to one of his advisors, the Nobel Prize winning economist James Tobin. And as Kelton recounts, Tobin recalls JFK asking, is there any limit to the deficit? I know, of course, about the political limits, but is there any economic limit? When Tobin confessed that the only limit is really inflation, the president replied, that's right, isn't it? The deficit can be any size. The debt can be any size, provided they don't cause inflation. Everything else is just talk. So even back in the 1960s, JFK captured the key insight of MMT. But how can you create more money without it inevitably leading to more inflation? There are many people still stuck in a mindset inherited from the era of the gold standard when since the value of dollars was tied to gold, if you printed more money, then you had to acquire more gold in order to honour your promised link to the gold. But by going off the gold standard, America could then print money without growing their pile of gold. And so now it seemed clear that this must dilute the value of the dollar relative to the fixed pile of gold. This is certainly how most Bitcoiners think about fiat currencies like the dollar. But actually, a more correct way to see how the value of the dollar is maintained is that it is backed by all of the goods and services that the dollars can buy. So now, if you print more dollars, you don't need to grow the pile of gold. You have to grow the real size of the dollar economy. As Kelton put it, coming up with the money is the easy part. The real challenge lies in managing your available resources, labour, equipment, technology, natural resources and so on, so that inflation does not accelerate. You don't want to have too much money chasing too few goods. So the extra demand from the extra money needs to be matched with an extra supply of goods and services. And that prevents the prices from going up. That prevents inflation. From this, Kelton argues that the key question for governments shouldn't be how shall we pay for it, but rather how shall we resource it? Now, of course, inflation is much more complex than this, but I hope I've given you a sense of why countries like America and Japan have been able to have long periods with high deficits and so growing debts, but still have low inflation. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, we've already seen that even JFK was aware of the basic ideas behind MMT back in the 1960s. But also, look at this clip when Paul Krugman was asked about MMT's assertions that America cannot go bankrupt because it issues its own currency. This is basically true. Um, but you don't need a new theory for that. We kind of knew that already. To a large extent, they're just doing Keynesian economics, but not they don't know that they're doing Keynesian economics and they've invented their own terminology for it. So I think Martin Wolf sums it up nicely in his book, The Crisis of Democratic Capitalism, when he says, critics counter that MMT is neither modern, nor monetary, nor a theory. Instead, they assert, it is old, fiscal, and mostly mere accounting. The MMT view is in fact more dangerous than it is incorrect. And in We Need to Talk About Inflation, by Stephen D. King, it becomes clear that many economists think that a key lesson from the periods of high inflation in the 20th century was that if a country has an inflation problem, give an independent bank the legal authority to tackle it. And that legal authority includes disciplining the government to stick within a largely balanced budget. The purpose of this explicit display of fiscal discipline is precisely to signal to the markets the country's commitment to low inflation, so that the rational expectations of all actors in the economy is that inflation will remain low. The deficit myth may indeed be a fiction, but many economists see it as a useful fiction given that human psychology plays a significant role in the complex dynamics of economics. That's why King says of MMT, it's tempting to conclude the proponents of MMT simply don't take inflation seriously. So I think there's an odd sense in which MMT has got almost a branding problem. Kelton, in her book and when interviewed, often tries to highlight just how central concerns about inflation are to the ideas of MMT. Deficits do matter, but they don't matter in the ways that we've been conventionally thinking about them. And the way we usually think about a deficit is that it's evidence of excessive spending. And that's just wrong. Evidence of excessive spending is inflation. So I would argue you don't have a deficit problem or a debt problem unless you have an inflation problem. But we've just had an inflation problem. And I guess many economists fear that once you've got high inflation, it's already too late. So the deficit myth is a rough guide that tries to help you avoid getting into inflationary problems in the first place. But back when this interview with Kelton was conducted in 2019, which was also when the book was being written, the world economy had been in a strange period since the 2008 financial crash, where for a decade or so, there was some fairly substantial deficits. The total US debt was still climbing year on year, and yet, inflation was low and interest rates stayed very low or even at zero. So there was a decade of evidence that tightly balanced budgets aren't always necessary in order to avoid inflation. So it's no wonder that MMT became popular during this time. But even back then, advocates for small government hated the idea that there could be even a little more room for sustainable economic spending by governments. And so they would suggest that supporters of MMT are proposing wildly irresponsible levels of spending. Well, if we're talking about funding the entire so-called Green New Deal, which is estimated anywhere from 40 trillion to upwards of 90 trillion, if you think that can be funded with the printing press, you're talking about Zimbabwe, Venezuelan type territory. I simply don't believe you could, in effect, create that much money finance government just by writing a check on the Federal Reserve and not having some adverse consequences. So to me, it seems that the nuanced message of MMT is too subtle to hold its own in the fast cut and thrust of public debate. It's too easy to caricature it and then to tear down the straw man version. And since the COVID pandemic, the case for MMT has gotten even harder to argue, as we now have seen the first substantial rise in inflation for decades. And it happened just after the massive rise in spending done to support the economy during and then after lockdowns. Of course, there is lots of debate about the primary causes for the rise in inflation. There's the impact from the supply chain disruptions from the lockdowns, the impacts of Russia's invasion of Ukraine, and the consequent sanctions and the rises in fuel costs. But 
For two years, there was also massive printing of money around the globe. And so again, it's just so easy for many to see a slam dunk relationship between printing money and inflation. But to my mind, if the deficit myth of balanced budgets were true, then we'd have to see government deficits near zero or even surpluses in order to get inflation back under control. But that just hasn't been the case. Inflation in America is coming down now and is predicted to be under 3% in 2024. But that's despite still having year-on-year -year deficits of well over a trillion dollars. So I think the case in favor of the basic ideas of MMT is still pretty strong, even if it is a hard case to argue in easy sound bites. But I'd say the simple take-home version is as follows. Countries that issue their debt in their own currency can afford to regularly spend a little more than they tax each year, to always be in deficit. But there is a level of deficit spending that would be too high. Conversely, budget surpluses are likely to be harmful to the economy. In other words, the classic ideas of austerity just don't make economic sense. So I like the challenge that MMT provides to the relentless calls to cut the welfare state in order to pay off the credit card from those who actually just want to privatize everything and have a much smaller state. There are details of MMT that don't convince me, like their suggestion to use the extra room for fiscal spending to implement a jobs guarantee. I think there are better ways to use the extra spending. But our societies are going through complex times where our old economic models are being simultaneously challenged by a range of major disruptions, such as demographic collapse, climate change, and AI and automation. So it seems highly likely that to successfully navigate this metacrisis, we're going to need to reimagine aspects of our economy. And to do that, we need to be able to see through our useful myths in order to better understand how our economies actually work. And The Deficit Myth is a great book to help bust one of those persistent myths. But have you read it already? What did you think of the book? And what do you think about MMT? Please do continue the discussions in the comments below. And if you enjoyed this review, then please do subscribe to my channel, where I explore ideas that might help get us through the meta-crisis. Thank you for watching.